Let your people who have called by your name humble themselves tonight in prayer and in exhortation. Father Lord, direct us with your wisdom. Don't allow your children to be put to shame. Because there is no one that trusts in the Lord today will be put to shame. Father, we call upon you. As many that will come to your message today, with a body in their hearts, let those bodies be rolled away. Let your knowledge precede over judgment. Let your understanding take center stage in our life. Lord, no man knows it all, but wisdom cometh not from them. The depths, not from the heights, but they come from the Lord. Lord, let your wisdom envelop us. Teach us what you want us to learn. That in everything, your name alone, we have privilege. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God bless you, brethren. Today, you are welcome to the presence of the Lord. Our message for today is God's mission plan. God's mission plan. Does God have a mission plan? And when we are talking about God's mission plan, we are discussing about God's mission plan for the entire world because the world is his creature. And because the world is his creature, when he plan, he's not planning for one particular church. He is planning for the entire world. And that is why today we shall be looking at, looking at this particular topic in a whole new dimension. What kind of plan does God have for this world? What is his mission plan? What is his mission statement? And what is his decision? And why did he send us out to preach the gospel, even among hostile community? Why is mission the center stage or called the mother of the church? Why does God want Christians to go out and save others? Why are we not just content being saved alone? Why must we go out to teach our neighbor about Jesus Christ? Should we waste our time to take the cross to other people? Should we not be satisfied in just believing in Jesus Christ? Accepting him as our Lord and Savior, that should suffice us. After all, he died for us the way he died for others. So, if we find him, every man should find Jesus for himself. But, is that what God actually wants? Why does he want us to go beyond just going to church every Sunday, belonging to a congregation, saving the lost? He wants us to take a step further, to reach the unrich, to reach the lost and the forgotten people of the earth. Our text for today is taken from the book of Isaiah chapter 66 and Psalm 67. Isaiah 66 and Psalm 67. So I will read Isaiah 66 from verse 1. And what did he say? He said, Thus says the Lord, The heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you we build for me. Where is the place of my rest? God laid the foundation of the heaven. And he just tell you that heaven, he found it to be his throne. The earth is the place he put his footstool. So, how much resource do you actually have to build a house for somebody whose heaven is the place that is his throne? Where he sits. And he acts as a whole. Is the place he put his leg. So what manner of house. Can you really build for God. Can you really build a house for God. You know some people say. I want to build the house of God. Come and donate some money for us. Yeah it's wonderful. But can you really build God a house. Because he has done all these things for himself. He has built his own house. And he has also built his own stone. Where he put his leg. The universe as a whole are his. So there is no manner of house you can build for God. And where is the place that you will call 
the place where he rests. If heaven of heaven cannot contain him, the earth is the place where he put his leg. What bed are you going to design for him to rest? And what house are you going to build for him? Let's go to 66 verse 2. He said, all these things you are trying to do, I have done it for myself already. You meet with some Christian, they say, I'm a builder. The Lord wants me to build his house. That's wonderful. But can you really build a house for God? How rich are you? Solomon was the richest no man on earth, yet he could not build God a house. He, God only agreed to build a house where his name would be put. Not God. Because he could not build God a house. The heaven is his throne. The earth where you and I stand is the place where he put his leg. His footstool. As big as this world, it is his footstool. So what manner of house are you thinking of building for God? And it's said to you, all those things hath my hand made, and all those things have been before you were born. Says the Lord, what are those things? His house, the place of his rest, his footstool, he has built it for himself. Before you were born, even before you ever dreamt to come to life, God has built his own house. He doesn't need you to build a one. So then, what does he require of us? If God has built his own house for himself, let's go further. It said, all those things you want to do, I have done it already, says the Lord. But this man will I look, even to him that is poor, and of a contrite spirit. Let's try this verse 3 in another fashion. Like I'm preferred. He said, For all these things my hand has made, and so all these things have come into being by and for me says the Lord. But this is the man to whom I will look and have regard for. He who is humbled and of a broken and a wounded spirit and who tremble at my word and reverend my command. The man that trembled at my word and reverend my command. That is the man I will choose. I'm not going to choose somebody else. I'm going to choose a man that tremble at my feet and reverence my word. That is the man I am going to choose. And that is what God has required of us. But how do we bring up a people to be able to qualify for the people that God will choose? Then what ministry do we have? And what plan for mission does God himself have for us? He makes it clear to us in verse 3. The act of the hypocrite worship are an abomination to God, as if they were offered to an idol. He who kill an ox, there will be guilty of slewing and sacrificing a man. He who offer a serial offering is as he who offers swine blood, which is an abomination to God. And he who burns incense to God 
is as if you bless an idol. Such people have I chosen. Their own ways, they delight in their abomination. God is saying, He has no delight in your sacrifice. That if you are offering to Him all your killing of us, goats, sheep, as it were in the manner of the ancient, when the children of Israel was offering sacrifice in Moses, God said to them, you are like somebody that has slaughtered a mouse and offered it before him. It's an abomination to God. And God said, if you offer to him even cereal and corn offering, you are like somebody who offers swine blood, which is also an abomination unto the Lord. So, if God does not require our sacrifice, or our money, or our gift, or our car, what does he require from us? Who will get to that? Who will get to what God requires from us? So, I also will choose their delusion and mockery and their calamities and affliction. I will bring their fear upon them because when I call, no one answers. Hmm. And when I spoke, they did not listen or even obey. But they did what was evil in my sight and choose that in which I delight not. Hmm. Hear the word of the Lord, O you who tremble at his word. What is word? Why does God not say, Hear the word of God, you who tremble at his name? Tremble at his word. Not his name. Because God honor his word more than his name. God honor his name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. But God honor his word. Even more than he honored his name. And God said, if you tremble at his word, your brethren who hate you, who cast you out of my for my name's sake, and have said, Let the Lord be glorified, that we may see your joy, but it is they. Who shall be put to shame? The Lord said, Because all human beings on earth are burdens, and because we are brethren, if who you know when you are rejected for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the word of God which you preach, God said, Because you tremble at his word. You humbled yourself to preach the word of God. Because this Bible, Jesus says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the world. Make disciples of all nations. Discipleship. That's what God plans is for the world. Because man wants to have a destiny. The destiny of man was to be fruitful. Multiply. Replenish the earth. And subdue it. But man woke up one morning. He changed his destiny by an act of disobedience. And by that same act of disobedience, he reserved himself, prepared for eternal judgment. And the fire which will consume the ancestry. But God, in his wisdom and in his infinite mercy, knew that man had sinned. But he would not want to condemn man to eternity of 
wickedness and death, he drove man away from his garden to preserve his life so that he would die and would not live forever in sin. So God can save his spirit because man was too. But somebody will wonder, if God is all-knowing and he knew that man would fall, why did he create man in the first place? He creates man as a free moral agent to think for themselves, to make decisions for themselves, to have to make good use of their wisdom. God created man from the beginning. He made him two. The flesh, the physical man, and the spiritual man. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let him have dominion over the birds of the earth, over the fish of the sea, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God gave man dominion over the work of his hand. But God never said, let man have dominion over another man. Because that was not part of the agreement. <clears throat> the agreement of man was not to rule over their kind. Because God was their king. And that's why God was reluctant to give the children of Israel king when they asked for king. Because God knew it was a rejection of his reign over them. God appointed them judges. God appointed them captains. But God was their king. But they woke up one morning and said, no, we want to be like other nations. Today we still have Christians who want to be like other Christians. Who are looking for kings that will rule over them on earth. Who are looking for people that will go before them into battle. We want kings that will march ahead of us into battle. You don't need kings. Because one of you will chase a thousand, and two of you will put ten thousand to flight. Because you don't require king. But God was their captain. They turned down, they rejected the most high, and they sold him for thirty pieces of silver. That is the price God was worth to them. And when they have done all that pleases them. God still loved them. In his love, from the very first day they failed, he redeemed them. Because the moment they sinned, their nakedness did not take years to appear. Immediately they discovered they were naked. And they needed cut clothing. Because most times when we hear about nakedness, I have seen some things try to duplicate it. Adam and Eve were naked in the garden. They never knew they were naked because their eyes were covered. <laughs> no. There is physical nakedness and there is spiritual nakedness. Spiritual nakedness is when you are exposed to danger. Because things that you're supposed to have dominion over did not turn out to hurt you. Things that are your servants now become your commanding officer. Man gave the name lion to lion. But when man sing, he see lion and run away. Man gave the name tiger to tiger. But when man sing, he see tiger and run into the bush. Even the bears, the name, they were running from the bears. Because nakedness exposed you to weakness, to death, to affliction to sin, to pain, and to tribulation. As it is then, even so it is now. A lot of Christians, because of their nakedness, has exposed themselves to untold dangers. And God knew about this. But from the foundation, God has a plan. The devil's plan was to force God's plan. To make sure the man who was the glorious image of his maker, 
did not amount to anything. To ensure that man failed after the same example of the fallen angels, which he has deceived. That's why he deceived Eve. Adam was created before Eve. The devil never came to Adam. He went to the weaker vessel. And he deceived the wife. And the wife deceived the husband. Because that was a strategy. And the strategy for going for the fruitful vine and the tools that was created for their reproductive offspring and corrupt the seed of a woman so that the seed of a woman will not rise to bruise his head. But unfortunately, the seed of a woman did rise and he will bruise the head of the serpent. And that same story is the reason why you and I are Christian today. Because God did not abandon us when we fell like he did the fallen angels. That's why in the book of Psalm, the angels say, Who is man that thou art mindful of? Who is this son of man that you should even visit him? You make him even a little lower than angel in creation. Yet you cross him with strength and honor. Beyond everything. And when you bring his son into the world, he says, let all nature worship him. And let all the angels and the host of heaven worship him. That is the God you are serving. Man was in a place of authority. Power to command. Power to lose. Power to create. Power to bound. All was at his fingertip. But man chose abomination over all those gifts. And because we did not trust our maker, we trust his creator more than we did the creator. We put our trust in a serpent that was formed in the garden, not in the one who gave us the garden. Even today, it is so. So many Christians trust in pastors more than they do God. They trust in their so-called spiritual leaders, prophets, and teachers more than they trust in the Almighty God and the Word of God, the Bible, which He gave to us. Some Christians don't care reading the Bible. As far as it came from man, it is stamped. They take it without confirming it. That's why Paul spoke well of the Bereans. The Bereans was noble. More noble than the Thessalonica. In India, when they heard the word, they sit down, they analyze it. They test every word just as Mark tests meat. And they try every word that comes from the Bible. And they see if truly this was the word of God. Remember what the Bible said to us. He says, if an angel or a dreamer of dream come to you and prophesy in the name of God. And the prophecy came to pass instantly. He said, you should believe him. But if he said to you, let us go and worship other God. Or do something contrary to what is written in this word. He said, let that angel or that prophet be cursed. So today, why are Christians listening to some effective message that have no basis in the scripture? That have no roots from the Bible? All these are Satan engineer. His titles have not changed. The 2,000 years old, the more than 2 million years old serpent is still at his gate. He told Adam, he told Eve, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. He didn't tell them they will not die. But they will not surely die. So, what is the devil telling you today? Telling you, don't worry, you will not surely lose your work. You will not surely miss heaven. The rapture does not matter. It does not exist. There are a lot of signs. 
You can repent what Christ is already here. When you see him coming in the sky, you can see amazing grace and repent. Is that not what he's telling you? <laughs> oh, God is not a wicked God. God is not going to throw any of his creatures into hell. But remember the angel that fell. The angel that sinned, they were cast down. And they are reserved under chain, under judgment. The Lord your God is a jealous God. And his name is jealousy. He doesn't change who he is. Neither does he compromise his standard. He's a righteous God. And the Bible says, if I wet my great sword, my hands lay hold on judgment. He is a righteous God. He does not tolerate sin. But man decide to go their path. And since that day till today, man has lost their destiny. But because of God's mercy, an innocent lamb was slain. A lamb who has not seen after the similitude of man. A lamb who was spotless, who no sin was falling, though he was tempted in every way, yet found without sin. Though he was tried, but yet without compromise. He was beaten, bruised, we hid as if we had our faces from him. That lamb, that sacrificial lamb, was used to cut man in the garden. <clears throat> so that man would not lose their eternal destiny. And what was God telling man in the garden? But before the lamb was slain, Man did see their nakedness with their eye. They know they get exposed. That anything can take care of them because they are naked. And their fragility. Because nakedness brings fragility. And because they are fragile, they can easily be destroyed. So they try first to cover themselves up. By sowing fig leaf for themselves. To make apron. And today, a lot of Christians are sowing fig tree leaf to cover their shame in the name of religion. And it's the same apron. And this apron is what today many Christians are sowing to cover their sin. You ask everybody in the streets, they will testify they are Christian, but their ways are far from God. Because they all cover themselves with apron, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. The first reaction of the thinking of man when he sinned is to deny the fact, reality, that what he has done is wrong. When he see that does not stand, that the guilt is much, the next thing is to try is to try to free himself to atone by doing some supplication or penance whatever you call it trying to save his soul but when he discovered that his though his tears forever flow all for sin cannot atone though his blood flow for nothing that kingdom come it cannot make the offender clean that the wages of sin is death so Man was doomed to die. But God saw all this. He clotted them with an innocent lamb. Telling them is by the slave of an innocent blood that you can be clotted. God had to take an innocent life to save man who sinned. God became a man and he died for our sake. And that man was Jesus Christ. And he died to redeem us once and for all. Christ did not need to die twice. But once death forever clean. If it was a man, we would need every man to die every year for our sake. 
because they cannot continue because of death. But this high priest, because he has a testimony that he lives, because the Bible told us he was a priest after the order of Melchizedek, which has no beginning of days, no ending of days. So because he had the testimony that he lives, his blood was shed for the remission of our sin. And with that sacrifice, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. And this becomes the mission. And what is the mission? Is it that Christ is coming to die? No. The mission is to share it to the people. That no matter the sacrifice that was offered on behalf of man, if man does not accept this sacrifice, he cannot be saved by this. And that's what we're going to study in John 3, 16. In the book of John, chapter 3, from verse 16. John 3, verse 16. John 3 16, it says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. <laughs> God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. So, why? Do we read this place? In verse 16, God make it clear to us in verse 17 that God did not send his son into the world in order to judge the world or to react or to condemn or to pass sentence on the world, but that the world might find salvation, freedom, that the world might find freedom through the son. Why would we need freedom? Salvation. We explained to you the fall of man. But man was needed being free from such deaths and impending danger. And for man to be free, he needs an atonement sacrifice. And that was why God sent his son. The son was not sent so that he can condemn us because we deserve punishment. For our sin, no. The son was sent for one reason and one reason only. Not to judge us or to reject or to condemn or to pass sentence on the world. But that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through him. Now, that is the mission of God. The mission of God, which is the gospel, is not to condemn people. It's not to look at somebody based on profession, quality, characters, and say, you, you don't deserve to be saved. You are a harlot. You, you don't deserve to be saved. You are a drunkard. You, you don't deserve to be saved because you are this. No. God's word was not to condemn any man. But his word is to save and this word was given to us, his mission plan. And that is what we are looking at today. God's mission plan. And what is God's mission plan? God's mission plan is not to reject, to condemn, or to pass sentence on the world. But God's mission plan is to save the world. To bring salvation to the world. To make safe and sound through him. That he might be able through us to draw all men and women to himself. That is his plan. That is God's mission statement. But the Bible says to us in verse 18 of John 3. That he who believes in him. Or. Cling or trust in him or relies on him 
is not judged. But he who trusts in him never come up for judgment. But for him there is no rejection, no condemnation. God does not care about what has happened in the garden. But he is telling you now that if you believe in the death of his son, that your life can be regenerated. That God can take you back to the garden where you fail from. He is able to prepare for you another new garden. Better than Eden. And that's why he told you, in my father's house, there are many marshals. If it were not so, I should have told you. That's why I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I'm done, I will come back to you. And I will receive you to myself. So that where I am, there will my servant be also. So, God is planning to take us back to Eden. But this time, a guide far better than Eden. Because Eden was no longer needed. Because man has corrupted it. But now God has planned for a better guidance. And to give us what Lucifer and his fallen angel lost. And to give us a home built solely on light. And to give us a kingdom that need not sun. And that is the kingdom that God has prepared for us. And he has been preparing this house for the past 2,000 years. And we await his return. And when he returns, he will take us back to that house which he has prepared for us. And that is why he told us here that if you believe in him, you will not be judged. Nor will you, God remember your sin. And he made it clearer to us in the scripture that if the blood of goat and of bull can take, make the offender clean, how much more will the blood of Christ shed forth with that spot wash your dead conscience? God's blood is able to purify your heart. He's able to sanctify your soul. And he's able to repair you for a kingdom that God himself has prepared for you. And he is saying to you, that if you trust in him, or if you believe in him, you will not face his judgment. Nor will you suffer rejection. No condemnation. He incurred no damnation at all. But he who does not believe, or cleave, or rely on, or trust in him, is judged already. He doesn't need judgment because he has judged himself in the garden. So God will remember the same sin that his mother that, and his father that born him committed in the garden. And because of that sin, he has already chosen to disobey God rather than choosing to obey serpents rather than to obey God, which is an act of disobedience and which punishment will be swift. That's why there is no guiltless person on earth. That's why if we say we have no sin, we are a liar. And we make God a liar. And he made it clearer to us that we are already judged if we refuse to believe. Not only are we already convicted and has already received his sentence. So we do not need to wait for the end of the world to receive the sentence. The sentence is clear for those who refuse to accept Christ. Because he has not believed. And this is the sentence. Because he has not believed. In and trust in the name of the only begotten son of God. He is condemned for refusing to let his trust rest in Christ's name. That is the condemnation. And the basis of this judgment or indictment is the test by which men are judged on the ground of this sentence lies in this 
The light has come into the world. God gave his son as a light to the world. And the people have loved darkness and they hated the light. So, rather than and more than the light, so because their work and their deeds are evil. So, God does not dwell with evil. And that is the judgment. So, our mission plan, what is it? What is our mission plan? To preach the good news. The news of peace. The news of harmony. The news of joy. The news of healing. The news of deliverance. The news of raising the dead. The news of restoring the captive and those in bondage to freedom. And for encouraging those who mourn. And to comfort all that are even mourning in the house of the Lord. This is our message. <coughs> and if you want your mission to succeed, this should be your message. Your message is not of condemnation. There is no path where God says, I bring my son so that I can destroy you. No. Jesus was sent to bless us. Even when Jerusalem rejected him, what did he say to them? Say, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long would I have loved to gather you as the hen gathered his chicks? But you will not. So because of this, your house is left unto you desolate. What God would have preferred is to gather us together as the hands bind together his chicks. God wants unity in the body of Christ. God wants Christians to be united. God does not want to bring this unity in the body of Christ. But I tell you, but because of this God or this world is already judged, there shall be two in one house divided. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And the sister-in-law against her father-in-law. This is the verdict. It is not because he wants this. God has always been the prince of peace. But when you choose to force his hand, you live in no ocean. Christians, God loves us so much. He loves us so greatly. For God so loved us greatly. And he prized us so high that he gave his only begotten, unique son. So that whoever believes or trusts in or cling to or rely on him shall never perish but have everlasting life but god did not send his son into this world because he wishes to condemn the world but there is a reason why god sent his son in Isaiah 41 from verse 19 to 10 i took you from the ends of the earth from the fattest corner I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and I have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That is God speaking. And he's calling you. And Jesus himself make also his call when he was on earth. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavily laden. I will give you rest. He said, come and lean on me. Because my yoke is easy. My body is so light. Amen. And you will find rest for your soul. Are you ready to find rest? Do you want rest for your life? Do you want rest for your business? 
Do you want rest for your ministry? Do you want rest for your marriage? Or for your children? The Lord is calling you. If you are tired of labor, come. Come. His plans are not dangerous. He is not in a forced recruitment exercise. He is not forcing you to come to the mission. He is not forcing you to come to any church. He didn't say, if you don't come to church, I'm going to put a dagger and slaughter your you. No. He said, come unto me, all you who have labored for the world, who are tired of labor. You have labored with sickness. You have labored with pain. You have labored with affliction. You have labored with tears. You have labored with anger. And you are tired of labor. Come. If you are thirsty, come. If you are hungry, come. The Lord says, come and drink wine without money. It doesn't cost anything. Come and eat to the full without money. This is what he's calling you to. God is calling you. He said you should come. Come and take joy. Come and take peace. Come and take blessing. Come and take healing. He is calling you today. He is not calling you to make you poor. He is calling you to bless you. He is not calling you to cast you away. He is calling you so that he can gather you home. God is calling you. Are you going to listen? He said, come to me, all you who have labored in the world. And you are tired of laboring for the world. I have rest for you. That is our mission plan. Our mission plan is simple. Come. The spirit of the Lord is upon us. He has anointed us to preach good tidings to the meek. To proclaim liberty to the captive. To preach recovering of sight to the blind. To preach deliverance to the captive. To preach freedom to the oppressed. This is what message we have. That is the message. It's a message of joy. It's a message of saving lives. It's a rescue mission. Don't be deceived. God is not religion. Christianity we are talking about here in this teaching of mission is different from the Christian religious study. It's different from the old doctrinal religious system. It is the pure gospel. Visit the hungry with bread. The poor in your gates should not be looked down upon. Take care of the orphans and widows. Do not rob idol temple. And that is the message. The message is not grievous. His ways are simple. His thoughts and healings are for you. He is not calling you so that you can take what you have. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your car. He needs your life. Your soul is on a rescue mission. He is calling you so that he can bless you. And you heard me say to you, what manner of house can you build for God? How much do you have? The goat of the thousand hills they are his. Do you really think if you were hungry, would he eat the blood of a bull, of a goat, or drink the blood of his wine? If God was hungry, he would not tell you the cattle of the thousand years, they are his. If he was hungry, he would have taken anyone and eat. But he's asking you, will he eat the flesh of a goat or drink the blood of a swine? God is not a man that he should lie. He has no reason to lie to you. People lie because they are afraid. But God is afraid of no one. So he's not, he has no reason to deceive you. 
You are not giving him anything. He is not owing any man that he will repay. Neither has he taken anything from anyone <coughs> that he must give back to. Brethren, God delights you, not what you have. <coughs> Let us pray. Brethren, come to the Lord. <coughs> The Lord said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavily laden. I will give you rest. Lord, as many that will come to you in earnest tonight, give them rest. Give them rest from whatever affliction. Give them rest from whatever problem. This we ask in Jesus' mighty name. We pray. <coughs> Thank you.